My name is Jeremy Norman. I'm the principal owner of Soho Gyms. And before that, I was started the world famous Heaven Nightclub. I'm Derek Frost, and professionally, I used to be an interior designer. I met Derek when he was 25 and I was 29. We've been together ever since. I heard on the radio someone saying that spring travels up through Britain at the pace of a walking man. And I thought that was an intensely romantic notion. Every summer, Derek and Jeremy charter Kalani, an 80-foot, twin-screw, diesel motor yacht. Usually, they cruise the Mediterranean. This journey will be different. They'll start at the tip of England, the Isles of Scilly. From there, they'll go up the Bristol Channel to South Wales. And from South Wales, up the coast of Wales, across the Irish Sea to Northern Ireland. Then, up the coast of Northern Ireland, right to the very top, to Raithland Island, and then across to the Mull of Kintyre in Scotland. They'll then proceed up the Inner Hebrides to Ullapool, taking in all the famous islands, and then from Ullapool, across the treacherous Minch to the Outer Hebrides, and from there, on to St Kilda, hopefully, if they make it. Previously on Chasing Spring, the weather is grim, but there were still places left to visit before leaving the Silly Isles. Sampson Island was one of these. Almost long marrow, and that would date it to either the Neolithic or Early Bronze Age. They also visited Annette Island before leaving the Scillies and heading north for Lundy, where Derek took in the view from the top of the Victorian lighthouse. From there, they crossed the Bristol Channel en route to Milford Haven. It's a beautiful start to the day at Milford Haven. The estuary is at its most scenic. You can't help but notice the haze of new green shoots on the windswept oaks that line the shore, their buds bursting open in the spring sunshine. After lunch, Derek and Jeremy go ashore at Lorany Quay, about three miles upriver from the sea. They walk inland through beautiful broad-leaved woodlands. Spirits are high and the birds are singing. That's a big tree there. David Evers and Marguerite Shakespeare are along for the trek, as is new arrival Michael Waterhouse, Jeremy's great friend from university. Michael is a renowned ornithologist and the author of A Wandering Voice, a diary of birdsong. It's a very, very fluty sound, and Gray had five birds that he absolutely adored their song. One was the nightingale, one the blackbird, the black cat was the next, and then the curlew and the eider duck, believe it or not. But black cap is a warbler, comes to Africa, the male has a black head, the female a brown head, and um, there was some quote from literature in The Charm of Birds where Grace says the black cap, like the gypsy in front of the castle gate, sang very completely. Yeah, that's not destroyed the tree. Look at that. So, a present for your birthday. Thank you, Jeremy. Cherry blossom. How lovely. Um, priceless present, thank you, my yeah. darling. <laughs> it was priceless. We're looking across a field of rape in flower at uh, a destroyed Norman castle, Carew Castle, or as the locals call it, Carew Castle. Wow. You can see from the castle architecture that it was originally a Norman castle but has been much altered in Tudor times to provide a nicer accommodation for whichever family lived in it. Back on board, everyone celebrates Derek's birthday with a glass of champagne. Well, we can't go through Jack Sound. Either my mum or my dad call it to say happy birthday, which is sad. It's such a uh, yeah. hideous yeah. time. That's the first time. Well, yeah, just the first time. Well, yeah. Seven knots and there's big rocks yeah. everywhere. for them. Thank you so Lots much. Lovely to have you all with us. Many happy returns thank, you. thank you, Michael, for the champagne. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Later, over dinner, spring travels through the British Isles at the pace of a walking man. And it was that rather romantic thought that actually inspired me to, to think about doing this journey. I thought the idea of being in the golden time, as Michael has said, perpetual spring for two and two plus months 
Oh yes, um, yes. Is, is rather romantic, lovely thought. Tell our guests about what we're, we're likely to encounter tomorrow. But we're going primarily to visit um, three islands. Well, two islands and a stack. <laughs> We're going to see this, the, the four or five different species of real fantastic marine birds. And the Manx Shearwater is probably the most charismatic of the lot. And it's a mini albatross. And it goes off many thousands of miles into the South Atlantic for most of the year. And it comes back for two months to nest. Now, the other, the other ones we'll see are members of the Orc family, which are the Guillemots, the Razorbills, and the Puffins. They go out into the Atlantic, but they don't fly. They just go and settle on the water, and they, you know, they fish, but they don't fly. But the Max Shearwater goes for thousands of miles, and it has very long, thin, stiff wings like an albatross, and can glide for hundreds and hundreds of miles. Doesn't use any energy. Fantastic sort of aeronautical performers, you know. Tell the tall so, tale about the old Max. So the Max Shearwater. Yeah. Well, what they did is they took one of these birds, ringed it. And they put it on a 747 and took it over to the other side of the Atlantic and it was back in its nesting burrow, I think in something staggering like three days' time. Oh, very good. <laughs> I think it's top of Good morning. Good morning. Where are we? Uh, we're in Dale, in Milford Haven. Milford Haven. Yeah, we're just lifting the anchor up. Right. And we're just heading out. Right. We're going to go and have a look at the uh, natural marine reserves, the islands out there. Well, we're just about 40 minutes out, out the entrance here, actually. It's in a mile when we get out through the channel. And they want, what are they? Stockholm and Skoma. Exactly. And we're going to go and have a look at Grassholm as well. How do they describe the sea states? Uh, moderate, 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 rough in the west. Right. Fantastic. Big bloody great sea. Grassholm Island is home to 37,000 nesting pairs of gannets. Late afternoon sees Kalani at anchor off the port of Fishguard, where they'll spend the night. We were all that distance from the island, and do you remember we said, from miles away, we said, look, it's that island that's got that sort of line of white on the top of it. Yeah. And as we got that's nearer right. to it, nearer to it, we it suddenly realised that it wasn't one. a line of like chalk, it was, it was just birds. Well, there was this enormous sea, Derek, and, and sitting in it all by itself was one bird. Yeah. I didn't realise But do you know, that. why do you think they all live together like that? It's obviously not... They in... like each other. Yeah. Well, that's a very delightful warm, answer. Warm. But isn't yes. it because yeah. those sort of ground nesting birds need islands where there are no ground predators? And there are well, very few of those. And that's that's why they... One of the reasons, obviously, they have to be near the sea because they're seabirds. Well, so it, it was a staggering sight, wasn't it? Was it? The gannets. Staggering sight. It was a staggering yeah. sight. The air mm -hmm. thick with them and also the, the amazing tides that were around it, weren't they? You know, yes. I mean, the way the sea was churning. The way you get the, 
they sort of tides are getting a churning up of the ocean right. and possibly an upwelling of plankton and sand eels. There's probably a huge amount of available feeding, food. a feeding, yeah. yeah. Well, well there would have to be, I mean, that so. number of birds, I mean, what are they? 37,000 pairs, so that's... Yeah, like nearly 74,000 birds, and I mean the birds are huge, yeah. aren't they? I mean their yes. wingspans are four foot across. Yes. It's a beautiful but chilly spring morning in Fishguard. We've come from the Scilly Isles, yeah. up to Lundy, up to Milford Haven, round to um, Fishguard, which is, which is where we are now. Which is where we are now. Which is just which in is here. Just there. Yeah. And then today we're going up to where? Just up, up to Puelli. To Puelli. Up to Puelli, yeah. Pufeli. I'm going to make a call now, but it's coming out, the forecast is coming out of the southwest. I mean, there's nothing today. It's variable yeah. two to three, yeah. but tomorrow it'll be increasing four to five and possibly six from the southwest. The passage across Cardigan Bay provides a wonderful diversion. We're joined by two bottlenose dolphins. There they are. There he is. Yeah, there they are. Look. Big one. Two. Go there. It's the same one. There's two. Another one here. Come. They all sit down to discuss the plan to have the 7.5 metre Cobra Rib towed up to Scotland from its base on the Solent. The tender they have is too small for big seas and rough water. The negative factors are that on the big rib you can't beach it, whereas you can with the small rib, which would have meant that, for example, the Cillies we couldn't have landed at Amit or Samson, unless we had had Dimmy on board to drive it and to hold off, and even then the big rib draws more, and so it's, you know, in very shallow tidal waters, that also limits you. And you won't be able to hold beach, that rib. That's it. The size of that rib against the tide, yeah. there's no way of being able to hold that. Yeah. And if, if it got beached, that's it. Yeah, if it got beached, you won't be able to hold that rib. So that was one consideration. Um, the other consideration, of course, is uh, attaches to the other thing we want to discuss is fuel. And we, would, we don't want to be landing with a rib we can't get fuel for. Mm. That would be a really big impediment. And fuel's different in Scotland than it hasn't it? Because you don't have gas stations at the marinas. Mm, no, not really. You get diesel, but you, you can't. You've got to travel inland mm. a lot of the time. There's fuel cans. And yeah. You talked about that. Yeah. And my conclusion on the basis of what we've all said, and it's a with great reluctance because I, you know, having the, the big rib was very much part of the way I'd envisage the whole trip. But you know, given what we've all now said, um, and the experience we've had to date, you know, I know that I would not be want, wanting, frankly, to leave this nice warm boat to get into that rim to do a two and a half hour passage in a force six. I just wouldn't want to do it. Obviously, I'm with Jeremy on this. I mean, we, we, we're all kind of getting there, and we're a bit reluctant to be getting there. But I think we all know what the sensible decision, is. what the sensible issue yeah, yeah. is. Without an extra pair of hands to captain the rib, they reluctantly decide to abandon the plan to bring the Cobra north. Then, Derek has an inspiration. They contact their friend, Rob Common, on the off chance that he's available to join the voyage as captain of the rib. To their amazement and delight, he agrees immediately, instantly solving the problem. He'll meet them in Scotland in May.
With the problem resolved, they spend the afternoon in Abasok, where Jeremy explores the foreshore. Yeah, this very coarse grass stabilizes the dune and allows other plants to then colonize the stable dune system. And again, the roots of these sort of plants again help to stabilize and build a natural colony of plants. Now, if you watch very carefully, you'll see little holes in the dune. Those holes are made by solitary bees, and you'll see them in a moment visiting. There's one coming onto this hole. It's amazing what you will see if you just wait and watch. Having said goodbye to Michael, David and Marguerite, Derek and Jeremy are joined by a new group of guests. Friends Don and Teresa Fogarty and John and Sarah Lloyd arrive. They quickly avail themselves of the early spring sunshine on the upper deck. They decide to explore Bardsey Island. Bardsey is famous for its wildlife and rugged scenery. A bird observatory was established here in 1953. the eastern side of Innis Enfi, uh, or Bardsey Island, which is just off the Flynn Peninsula in North Wales. And it's uh, um, an area of special scientific interest and a nature reserve. It's famous as a nesting place uh, for Manx shearwaters, who nest in rabbit burrows and fly in at night with their rather ghostly calls that uh, people used to think were sirens singing. And um, what else have we seen? We've seen quite a lot of grey seals. Three of them. Three of them. Three seals there. Fine, if I just go to the right of that. Well, you know where trouble. it is on the chart, of course. Okay. So you see, you see it positioned on the chart. That's Those are a pair of shell duck there swimming in the bay, and they are our largest British duck. Um, and they nest out <laughs> rabbit burrows, like the Manx Shearwater. <laughs> This is what's known as eggs and bacon, birth foot trefoil. It's called eggs and bacon because at some stage it has a bit of red in it as well. It looks like it's yellow and red, but I can't see any red in here. They meet Richard Brown, the assistant warden of the island, and are invited to tea with the warden's wife. Ten, ten years, this is 11 years. And how do you find it? Good. Beautiful. Yeah, I'm happy to be here, and even in the winter. It must be pretty really lonely, isn't it? No, it's not lonely. <laughs> How many people live here in the winter? Uh, about seven, seven or eight, something like that. It, it varies slightly from year to year. Um, but yeah, it's pretty lonely. Yeah, it's pretty lonely. Yeah. 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 Yeah
It'd be yes. awful if you didn't. Wouldn't it? <laughs> well, it can be difficult sometimes. Yeah. Well, the trust that owns the island is uh, not related to us as a bird observatory in any way other than we lease the buildings from them. Right. Um, the bird observatory is run as a completely independent organisation. Uh, we have our own council. The observatory has the council. I see, council. and that raises funds. Yes. Right, and right. Fly. There's something you might be interested in. What's oh. that? A black cap. Is it yes, okay. Yeah. Let's have a look. I it. Okay. Right, okay, let's go and have a look. Emma's also got the permit, which means we're licensed to uh, handle and ring the birds. Was well, that a female? Yes. Black. Black caps. Yeah. The females males have a black. And the females have a brown cap. Yeah. Basically, what you're seeing is we're catching birds well. in a scientific manner to. Uh, Put a little ring on their leg, which right. uh, it's like you wearing a wristwatch, yeah. but on there's inscribed a unique number and an address. Right. So if anybody catches it again alive, there's several ways of catching birds, or if uh, someone finds it dead, if a, their cat gets it, or yeah. Uh, yeah. if it flies into a window, yeah. that data goes back uh, to the British Trust for Ornithology, who uh, and then it's look all compiled the in one huge database. They it? compile it and we can look at the movements of birds, also their longevity, uh, yeah, differences yeah, between yeah. birds uh, resident in different areas, differences in biometrics and uh, the way they live their, live their lives. Sure, sure, so, uh, sure. And does that scheme extend like with the Shearwater to where the birds go, like Brazil or the Falklands? Are there people there who are carrying out similar work? Yeah, most countries have their own uh, ring scheme and their uh, coordinated in Europe. Right. And someone said to us the other day there was an experiment carried out and someone took a shearwater to New York or somewhere like that. Yes. And within three days it was back. Yeah, they, you uh, heard that? they did that from Skokum. I think Ronald Lockley was certainly involved in the work. So it is an axiom of um, natural, uh, the laws of natural selection you can't pass on acquired characteristics. That's correct. So yeah. if there is a learned behaviour, it can't be passed on. Absolutely, yeah. So it has to be somehow innate. innate, but I don't see how the ability to navigate to a destination can be innate. I just don't understand how that could possibly be. Is it, I mean, it's it's mystery, easy to it? say north and south, but it's a mystery. I'm not yeah. sure if anybody yeah. has. Yeah. Yeah. Later, they get a chance to sit down with the warden. As I was saying to your colleague, the Manx Shearwater, water, which everyone tells me nests down rabbit holes, but I don't see any rabbits. There are no rabbits. Uh, rabbits became extinct uh, in 1986. Uh, the exact reason uh, for their demise is unknown. Uh, there was an outbreak of myxomatosis uh, the mm -hmm. previous autumn, but from uh, August to January, the population just plummeted, and th there's not been a record since. We, we've been told by no the Countryside Council for Wales that we, we cannot reintroduce them. Because it is a natural natural extinction and, and yes. should be respected as such, which is a yeah. perfectly valid scientific viewpoint. If, if it was but, a natural extinction. But what, what um, oh, that, that's interesting, how could it not have been a natural extinction? I don't believe that Mixie would have wiped out the rabbit population. So who would have done it? I have no idea and I don't know how. The rabbit population that had Mixie uh, endemic within the population. Uh, it was sight little. We know the years that there were Which is common with myxomatosis, and yeah. there's always a percentage that survive. And they always survive. Yeah. They always, always survive. survive. So this is a case for Inspector Morse? Or oh, someone. That evening, Derek and Jeremy host a dinner on board for their friends. It was a big sea, quite a big sea, wasn't it? On the other well, side, it was like flat. And, and uh, you know, we clearly should have been the other side of the island, I guess. The well, only thing is that Jeremy's yeah. idea that we were going to be sheltered in the lee of the boat, given that the boat was well, about oh, four know. miles offshore. <laughs> <Exactly. and then laughs> there was not much lee. Not at all. No, I was, I was, I was dry <laughs> as a boat. And we got He just mistimed it by... Seconds. Lad, I rest my case. But Dom, you were saying that that 
guy's wife was stuck for eight weeks offshore. She couldn't get back on the island right, because yeah. the sea was so bad. Oh, so we, there was nothing today, really. Eight yeah. weeks she couldn't get back. Eight on. weeks. She went to get some shopping on the mainland. <laughs> 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 it was beautiful on the island. There was quite quite nice. beautiful. Yeah. Really lovely. Next time on Chasing okay. Spring. Look, this is the old carriage that's made in 1898. Right out of the water. There's been a made out of a vessel lost in steering. <laughs>